Father God, we lift up to you all over the world the persecuted church. God, watch over them and bless them. And Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It's in Jesus' mighty name we're all in agreement. We say amen, amen. Well, tonight, get your Bibles out and go with me to John chapter number 21. Tonight, I want to talk to you about a subject called following Jesus. This is a part number one, if you will. Uh, I've got a couple of messages about this that over the weeks, whenever I'm ministering on a Wednesday night, that sort of a thing, I'll be going to some verses and going to this, this topic of following Jesus. John chapter number 21 is an interesting chapter. It wraps up the gospel of John, and uh, it's just an amazing way that Jesus reveals himself and his person to his disciples. Second thing that he does, he reminds them of his power, and then finally he reinstates their purpose. Now, you don't have to write all that down, you know, because we're going to go through some things tonight, and we'll, we'll talk about what, what took place. But we're going to go through some verses tonight, and I want you to think about Jesus and how he's taken these disciples. And for three years, they followed him. They followed his way of life. They've seen the miracles that have taken place. They've watched how he responds to things, like the Pharisees and the trickery of man trying to come against him. They watched as he was led to be crucified. In fact, John was there at the foot of the cross with Jesus' his mother. And here they are, after all is said and all is done, Jesus raises from the dead... And in John chapter number 20, there's two appearances of Jesus. He shows up in the middle of a room that's been locked because they were afraid. And Jesus tells them, I'm going to go ahead of you into Galilee. I want to meet you there. And it's at this point that we pick up the story. But I want to say this before we get into the, the scriptures for tonight. And that is that if we're going to follow Jesus, we have to recognize his person. Or I put in parentheses, who he is. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you're going to have to recognize his person, who he is. Because without that, you're not really going to follow him all that well. Without recognizing Jesus' person, it's not really going to be the best. See, there, there was a, a, a governor in Massachusetts a while back. His name was Christian Herter. He was running for a second term as governor of Massachusetts. And so one morning he was up and he was beating the streets, you know, running around trying to get votes and that sort of a thing. And so after a, a full morning, he was really hungry for lunch. And so it was a Sunday. And so that Sunday afternoon, he went to a church picnic. And so they were handing out food to everybody that came. And so he got in the line and he got himself a plate. And when he got up to the part where the lady was handing out the chicken, uh, she put a piece of chicken on his plate, and it was a little small drumstick. And so he looked up at her and he said, ma'am, may I please have another piece of chicken? I'm really hungry. She said, I'm so sorry, sir, but I've been instructed to give out one piece of chicken per person. And, you know, not wanting to, you know, really brag about who he was or throw around his weight or anything like that, you know, he, he kind of, you know, sheepishly mentioned, well, you know, ma'am, do you know who I am? I'm the governor of Massachusetts. May I please have another piece of chicken? And she looked at him and she said, do you know who I am? She said, I'm the woman handing out the chicken and I've been instructed to hand out one piece per person. Go ahead and keep moving. See, for all of us, we need to understand the position that Jesus holds. Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus is the King of kings. Jesus is the Lord of lords. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the author and the finisher, the first and the last. Jesus is the Son of the living God. He's the one who is broken from God's side. He is the one who came born of a virgin. He's the one who, with many infallible proofs and miracles, declared who he was with power by the Holy Spirit. This same Jesus who died, this same Jesus who took our sin upon himself on the cross, this same Jesus who who is raised by the power of the Holy Spirit, now who is seated at the right hand of the Father, this same Jesus who is the head of the church, this same Jesus who now calls us bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. He is the head. We are the body. This is the God whom we serve. That's who we're following is Jesus. So we have to recognize his person. John chapter 21, starting in verse number one, and we're going to read down through verse Number five, it says this, after these things, after what things? After Jesus showed up in the midst of the room and after Jesus talked to the disciples, after he breathed on them, after he revealed himself to Thomas and showed him his hands and his side, it says after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Now notice something, I want you to notice something, that Jesus is the one who's in control of this whole thing. Think about that for a second. Jesus is the one who's in control of this whole 
thing. The disciples had seen Jesus already two times. Jesus showed up in the midst of them. They didn't go looking for Jesus. They didn't go trying to find Jesus. Jesus was in control of when, where, and how they saw him. So it says after these things, Jesus now controls what's taking place. He's the one who's in charge. And it says that he showed himself again. And at the end of verse number one, it says, and in this way, he showed himself. Verse number two. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Now, notice it says his disciples. I've got that highlighted up on the overhead for you. His disciples. A disciple, we need to define this for all of us, okay? A disciple is a disciplined follower of Jesus. In this context, when we talk about his disciples, and that's you, and that's me, by the way, if you're born of the Spirit of God, if you are a Christian, You are a disciple of Jesus. What does that mean? It means you are a disciplined follower of Jesus. A disciple learns the way of the master or the teacher. Jesus is our master. Jesus is our teacher. Therefore, as disciples, we are learning his way, and we are disciplining our lives to follow him the best that we can. Can anybody say amen to that? So these guys, his disciples, were together. Verse 3, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Now, if you know the story of the disciples, you know that this was not an uncommon thing in their lives. These were fishermen. When Jesus came and he found them, they were fishing. Jesus had such a big crowd. He was by the sea one day, and he, he looked over, and he saw that there was this little boat, and the fishermen were cleaning their nets. And so he got into one of the boats, and he said, hey, launch me out a little ways. So Simon Peter launched him out a little ways, and he taught the people from the boat. Jesus knew these men. He knew their way, and he knew what was in them. And he found them as fishermen, but when he gave them a charge to follow him and said that he would make them fishers of men, they left all and followed him. So now, here they've followed his way of life. They've been disciples, and Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, one of his disciplined followers, says, I'm going fishing. In other words, he's going back to his old occupation. And look at what the rest of the disciples say. They said to him, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. I love the language of the Bible, don't you? Because the Bible oftentimes will contrast things for us. It says they went out immediately. In other words, Peter says, I'm going fishing. They said, we're going with you. And they all just like jumped in the boat right then and there like we're ready to catch fish now. You know what I mean? We're fishermen. This is what we do. We fish and we catch. So they all jump in the boat. But then the language changes, doesn't it? It says, and that night, in other words, not immediately, all night long. All all night is not an immediate thing, right? All night is not an hour. All night is several hours together of nothing. They're out there on the boat. They're throwing the net. Hey, remember when we caught all those fish over here that one day? That was a good spot, man. And they moved the boat over there. All right, let's sneak up. Let's wait a little bit. The fish will forget that we're here. They've all scattered. They probably come out by now. Ready, one, two, three. And they throw the net over and pull, right? And they pull it up and out and nothing, nothing. Well, there was that other spot over there. Let's go over there. And so they move the boat over there and they wait. Okay, you messed it up last time. You were talking too much. Sons of Zebedee, can't you guys get it together? One, two, three. They pull it up and nothing. All night they caught nothing. Verse four, but when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Jesus has a way of showing up in the morning, doesn't he? Sorrow may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Come on, somebody. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Remember, Jesus is in control of everything. I I like the scriptures in the Bible that talks about they were ready to kill Jesus, but he walked right through the midst of them. It's like, how did that work? You know, Jesus, I'm not gonna be the way that you think I'm gonna be any longer. You're not even gonna recognize who I am. And he walks right through the midst of them. He didn't change his form. He didn't change his shape. He didn't change his face. He was still the same Jesus. He just had power and authority to reveal himself to whom he will and to hide himself from whom he would. Wow. So here he is on the shore, and the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. Verse 5, then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? And they answered him, 
No. Now, I want you to put yourself in the place of the disciples for a moment because we could get down on the disciples. And I know myself personally, at times I've looked at the disciples and said, man, if that was me, I wouldn't do that. I know better. You want to know how I know better? Because I'm learning from their mistakes, right? They made the mistakes so that I didn't have to. But if I didn't know their story, would I be making the same mistakes? Yes, right? All of us would. So let's take a look at what they went through because oftentimes we can find ourselves in these very same positions. See, while waiting for the promise Jesus had promised them, I want you to wait until the promise of the Holy Spirit comes. I want you to to follow me. I, I want you to wait. And so while waiting for the promise, the disciples get restless. Peter goes into default mode, right? I'm going fishing. What is he doing? He's going back to what's comfortable. Who wouldn't, right? You're waiting on God and waiting on God and waiting on God. And what do we end up doing? I wonder what's on TV. I wonder what's happening on the, on the internet. Uh, you know what? I haven't talked to so-and-so in a long time. We always had a good time when we talked. We end up calling them. Instead of waiting on the Lord, he goes back to what's comfortable. Why? Because it's hard to wait. Has anybody noticed that in your life? It's hard to wait. No one likes to wait. We have microwave everything. We've got your meal in 30 seconds or less, or it's free. We've got instant downloads. We've got direct messages. We've got all sorts of things. You can text, you can call. No one calls anymore. Why? Because the text is quicker and easier. I can just get it done and then I can move on with my life. And then I don't even have to respond. I can give you a thumbs up on your text now just to let you know that I saw it and I'm acknowledging it so that you don't get mad and think that I'm ignoring you. Everything is instant. Everything is is immediate gratification. I want the song now, so I'm going to download the song now. In fact, I don't even have to purchase it. I can purchase the service where I can get every song in the world, six million songs, absolutely, as a part of my little $15 a month or whatever it is for that service. But then you need that service for that, and then you need this service for this, and then you need another service for this other thing that they came out with that's the latest and greatest, and you're not going to get their stuff with that service, but you're going to get this. And everything is instant. Everything is access. Everything is now. And it's hard to wait. Just go to the DMV and see how many joyful, happy people you see waiting around in those lines, right? I mean, you can make an appointment at the DMV, and you're still going to be going, I'm in hell. Why do I do this to myself? Why can't they put this stuff online so that I can get it now? but it's hard to wait. And the disciples followed Peter in this endeavor, didn't they? Peter says, I'm going fishing. They said, we're going with you. Almost like they were waiting for someone to say it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to be the first man, but if you say it, I'm going to go for it, right? So Peter, I'm going, Peter was just the mouthy one of the bunch. They were all thinking it. They probably were all, but they just decided, hey, we're going to follow. But they failed, right? They failed to catch any fish that night. All night, they labored. Now, remember, these are skilled fishermen. They knew the time to fish at night. They knew the labor it takes to fish. And even though they were rusty, come on, they should have caught something, shouldn't they? All night, they should have caught something. But they totally failed. Now, can I tell you the reason they failed? The reason they failed is because of who they followed. You got to get a hold of this tonight. Because they were recognizing Peter as their leader. I'm going fishing. We're going with you. But they should have been waiting for Jesus to show up. Because Jesus said, tarry in Jerusalem until the promise comes. But they had other instructions too. If you read in Matthew's gospel... Matthew 26, 32, Jesus himself told the disciples, Matthew 26, 32, but after I have been raised, I will go before you where? To Galilee. I'm going to show up in Galilee, in your hometown. So go find me there. Not go fishing there. Go find me there. Matthew 28, 7, after the resurrection, the angel is speaking to the women. Go quickly, tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Two verses, two separate time. Jesus himself and an angelic visitor tells them, go to Galilee and find me. They're not looking for Jesus. They're looking for what to do while waiting. But they should have been waiting and looking for Jesus for him to reveal himself to them. 
to reveal who he was. See, I think that this little detour, Jesus knew the heart of man, and so he allowed them to go out fishing, and he allowed them to catch nothing, and he allowed them to feel the failure because they should have been following Jesus. He had already told them to meet him where he was going, and he had already known where he was going to reveal himself to them. But he needed them to take this little detour, and he knew it was in their hearts, and he knew that they needed this little life lesson in failure to show up and to reveal himself to them. See, when we don't follow Jesus, we'll fail. But guys, can I tell you something? Failure is an intention getter to get us back to whom we should be following. Let me say that again, okay, because I don't want this to pass by you. This is foundational to following Jesus. Failure is an attention getter to get us back to following Jesus. Why? Because when we fail, we weren't following Jesus. Now, I, I, I got to define for this because sometimes people will say, well, I follow Jesus in praying for the sick and somebody didn't get healed. I follow Jesus, you know, he told me to go and start a church and I started a church and no one showed up. I follow Jesus and, and so, you know, he told me to go and do this and I went and I did it and I didn't see the results. Can I tell you something? Your definition of success is skewed if you think that numbers or outcomes is success. Success is following Jesus, regardless of the results. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, all these guys prophesied to people who didn't listen. But they succeeded, why? Because they did what God told them to do. See, we would think that Jeremiah was a failure because he prophesied to these people the word of the Lord and they still screwed up and they still did whatever was in their heart and they still ignored the word of the Lord. Jeremiah, you failed. No, he didn't. He succeeded. Why? Because he followed what God told him to do and he said what God told him to say and therefore he was a complete success because he was following Jesus. And we need to understand that in our lives we may follow God and not get the results that we think that we should get but if you have followed God, you have succeeded in doing what God wants you to do. You are fully successful when you follow God. So we fail when we fail to follow Jesus. Does that make sense? And failure is an attention getter to show us that we need to be following Jesus, right? And so here the disciples see, we've caught nothing all night and we failed and we need to recognize the person of Jesus. See, Jesus has the authority. Jesus is in charge. Jesus is the one who leads our lives. Can anybody say amen to that? Let me bring you to the second thing for us tonight is that if we're going to follow Jesus, we need to remember his power. Not only recognize his person, see him as he is, as he reveals himself to us. We need to recognize him as our Lord. We need to recognize him as our savior. We need to recognize him as the healer. We need to recognize him as the head of the church and the leader of our lives, as our brother, as our friend, as our, uh, our, our king and our God, right? But also, we need to remember his power. We need to remember that God is powerful and that Jesus, as we're following him, will give us that power. See, we get off track when we forget the great things that God has done in our lives. Do you remember when? Do you remember when God healed you? Just take a walk down memory lane for a second. Do you remember when God healed you? Do you remember when God saved you? Do you remember the pit that you were in? that he found you there and revealed himself to you and picked you up and set your feet upon the rock and he cleaned you off and he gave you a purpose and he gave you a life and he gave you a family and he gave you prosperity and he blessed you. Do you remember when you didn't know how you were gonna make it and all of a sudden God showed up and God came through and God did great and awesome and mighty things in your life? Do you remember the miracles? Do you remember the signs that God had along the way? Do you remember the wonders and the moments of awe when God just blew you away with a miraculous power. Do you remember? Because if you don't, you're not going to be following God very long. If you lose that wonder, if you lose that awe, if you lose that respect for what God has done in your life, you're not going to be following him. You're going to be following the next latest and greatest thing. We're going to get on, off track when we don't remember. See, it makes it easier to follow in the hard times when you remember how powerful God is. Because if you remember, well, God got me through that, surely he can get me through this. If you can reach back and you can find in the library of your mind those volumes of things that God has done in your past, 
then when your kids start repeating the same behavior, you say, well, this is what God did for me. God can do it for you too, kid. When you see how God provided for you in the past when they're having layoffs at the job, guess what? God already provided. He he brought me this far. He's not going to leave me. God will take care of my needs. God will take care of my family. God will take care of my future. When you lost everything and everybody turned their back and walked out on you and you felt so alone and you felt so ashamed and you felt just in wonder what's going on and you cried out to God and God, brick by brick, layer by layer, rebuilt a life that you couldn't even dream of, that couldn't even imagine. And after you'd been stripped, God built you up from the ground up and you remember how God restored and healed and blessed you. And when you go through present trials, you say, well, listen, God already did this. I've seen this. See, God loves to do show and tell. I'm gonna show you and then I'm gonna tell you about it so that way when you hit the real deal in the future, guess what? You're gonna be strong and you're gonna be healthy. Uh, Amy Carter, the daughter of President Jimmy Carter, had an assignment that she brought home on Friday night from school. Stumped by a question on the Industrial Revolution, Amy sought help from her mother, Rosalind, who was also fogged by the question and in turn asked an aide to seek clarification from the Labor Department. A rush was placed on the request since the assignment was due on Monday. Thinking the question was serious request from the president himself, the Labor Department official immediately cranked up the government computer and kept the full team of technicians and programmers working overtime all weekend long at a reported cost of several hundred thousand dollars. The massive computer printout was finally delivered by truck to the White House on a Sunday afternoon and Amy showed up in class with the official answer the following day. But her history teacher was not impressed When Amy's paper was returned, it had a big bright red letter C on it. Now, why do I tell you that story? It's because Amy, because of who her father was, things happened. Now, too many things happened, right, in this instance, but things still happened. Things moved, things started to change, things started to shift. And I think if we need something done in our lives, we simply need to remember who our father is. We need to remember his power. We need to remember that he can move mountains. We need to remember that he's the one who can make the sun stand still. We need to remember that he's the one, if our shadow is going this way, he can cause it to turn around and go that way. We need to remember that this is the God who parts the Red Sea. We need to remember that this is the almighty God who spoke and planets exist. That is our king. That is our God. We need to remember who our father is. John chapter 21, verse six through 13, Jesus is speaking to the disciples. Here they are, right? And he says, children, do you have any food? And they said, no. Verse six, and he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Now, again, put yourself in this, in this position. You've toiled all night. You could have just had a conversation with them and said, are you kidding me? I mean, really? We've been out here all night. We're fishermen. Who are you? You're standing on the shore. You're not in a boat. Do you know what you're talking about? We know what we're talking about, and we've been out here. There are no fish. If there was fish, we would have found them, for we are fishermen. And yet, look at what the text says. So they cast. So simple, isn't it? He says, go on the right side of the boat. You'll find some. So they cast. What did they do? They simply heard, and they simply did. So they cast. And now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Verse seven, therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he had removed it and he plunged into the sea. Probably took off his coat because he was fishing, you know what I mean? Getting sweaty and that sort of a thing. And so what does he do? He just dives in. He just jumps in after Jesus. See, when you've met up with God, when you've met up with Jesus, there's nothing gonna stop you from following him. And the moment Peter recognized his position, the moment he recognized who the person was that was talking to him on the shore, the moment he remembered the power, he plunged in. Why do I think that he did this? Because if you go back to Luke chapter five, when he first meets up with Peter, do you remember the story here? Jesus is, and he's teaching from Peter's boat, like we had mentioned. And as Jesus is sitting there in the boat with Peter. After he's done teaching the people, he turns to Peter and he says, cast out for a catch. Peter says, master, we toiled all night, yet at your word, I will cast. They had already cleaned the nets. They had already put everything away for the day. He was ready to go home and take a nap. And yet he recognized this great rabbi, this great teacher, and he said, at your word, I will cast. I don't think it's gonna happen, but guess what? Just because of who you are, because I respect you, I'll go ahead and do what you say. So Peter cast the nets out and the 
Bible says that the great number of fish that came into the net started to tear the nets, started to sink the boats, and as they brought them in, they had to have help from their companions, and they brought them in, but they were ripping the nets, and they were sinking the boats. I believe that Peter had this flashback at that moment when here he is, and he says, cast on the right side of the boat, and here Peter casts on the right side of the boat, and what happens? All of a sudden, here comes this whole rush of fish, and he might have, at that moment, remembered the power of God that ripped those nets. He might have remembered the power of God that started to sink those boats with the weight of the fish, and here he is having like a flashback, some deja vu in the Bible, right? Here he is just going, oh my goodness, and John says what everybody's thinking, it is the Lord, Peter recognized his person. He remembered his power and he lunges in to follow Jesus with everything that he has. He goes straight for him. Verse number eight, but the other disciples came in the little boat for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits dragging the net with the fish. Then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Verse 10, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you've just caught. Verse 11, Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Verse number 12, Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. You can imagine the hush that was over that meeting on the shore. You can imagine all of the disciples as they're dragging the fish up. They're not looking at the fish, they're staring at Jesus. You can imagine as Jesus is giving little instructions. They're running to and fro because it's the Lord. It's Jesus. And guess what? He caught us going back to our old occupation. And yet he's kind of cool with it. You know what I mean? He, he's saying, hey, bring the fish here. And so they bring the fish and like fishermen do, what do they do? They count the number of fish that they caught. And so they count up 153 fish. That's significant. Why? Because Every person matters. Everything that we do matters to God. And God often you'll find counted people, counted numbers. There's there's things all throughout the Bible that had significance that what we do matters to God, whether it's an earthly occupation or whether it's simply following the word of God. And when they followed the word of God, they got the results that they desperately desired all night. You can imagine they probably wanted to close up shop. They probably wanted to fold it up and say, listen, this is not rusty. We are done. Like we stink at this. We need to just go and be like tax collectors with Matthew or something like that. You know what I mean? And so here they are and they've toiled all night and yet they recognize and realize that when we follow the will of God, when we follow the way of God, when we have the word of God and we can follow Jesus, we get the things that we need in our life. They needed a catch and they only got it when they followed the word of the Lord. See, there's been times where in the ministry I've gotten discouraged. Times when the pressures have come on. Times when things I've said, God, I don't know what we're gonna do. God, I don't know what direction to go. But I'm always encouraged. I just had a conversation with a, a man of God today at lunch and we were talking about some things and he was mentioning that he's, he's so happy that he can sit down with other pastors and other ministers and other leaders and people who have gone the distance. Because anytime he gets discouraged with where he's at in the present, All he's got to do is ask one of these guys who's been around for a while, how did you deal with this? And they'll tell him, oh, God took care of that, man. God came through. God did this. Man, God showed up. God God moved big in my life. And, And for me, that's always been a comfort to me as well. You know, our founders still go to this church, and I'm so grateful because I'm able to say, hey, what did you do when this happened? And, and how did you deal with this? And, and what about that? Or anytime I start with, man, I'm really worried about this, they say, hey, calm it down. You know, like when does God ever give us permission to worry? Yeah, you're right, never, right? In fact, he says, don't. It's hazardous to your soul. You should not be worrying. You're, you're now operating against your faith. And so, come on, let's believe God. God will take care of it. I, I've heard statements out of our, our founders that, man, we wasted a lot of time praying about resources, praying about money, Praying about people. Listen, you just follow what God tells you to do and he'll fill the church. He'll fill the money. He'll fill the house. He'll fill the people's hearts. He'll fill their lives. He'll, he'll do it. You just follow him. Follow what he has to tell you to do. And it's no different with you guys. In whatever occupation you're in, whatever walk of life you're in, maybe you're starting a family. Maybe you've built a business. Maybe you're in that retirement season of life. But guess what? Be encouraged because God is who he says he is and he can do what he says he can do. I love how John recognizes the work of the Lord, don't you? 
cries out, it's the Lord. Why? Because it's so like Jesus to turn our failure into success. It's gotta be God. It's the Lord. Why? Because it's so like Jesus to redeem our past mistakes. It's the Lord. Why? Because it's so like Jesus to reward simple obedience, isn't it? It's got to be God when those sorts of things start to take place. There are reminders everywhere, right? The night of failure, the command to fish on the side, the miraculous catch, the fish, the loaves, they know it's him. He's revealed his person and he's reminded them of his power. You have a God who can move mountains. You have a God who can part the Red Sea. You have a God who can make the sun stand still and shadows move back. You are following a powerful God who can make things happen. Last thing for us tonight is this, is that if we're going to follow Jesus, we need to remain in our purpose. If I could have uh, Jared and any of the team that's here, you guys could come up on the platform tonight. I wanna conclude with this, is that if we're going to follow Jesus, we need to remain in our purpose It's been said that the value of a postage stamp is in its ability to stick to one thing until it gets to its destination. We too have to stick to what the Lord has told us to do. Stay in your purpose. Don't get distracted by peripheral things. John chapter 21, verse 13 and 14, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. I think it's important that we understand that Jesus kept showing up with the disciples. He kept showing up. He kept revealing himself. And there were waves of revelation that came every time Jesus showed up. First time he shows up, he breathes on them. Second time he shows up, he shows his hands and his side to a doubter. Third time he shows up, he reinstates their purpose. In fact, the conversation that ensues with Peter was quite a conversation. We'll get into that in another time. But ultimately, if we're disciplined followers of Jesus, our purpose is to follow Jesus. By definition, that's who we are, disciplined followers of Jesus Christ. If we're not careful, we'll get distracted. You know, I know in my own life, it's, it's not hard to get me distracted. I can be focused on one thing in a text message, a phone call, sound in another room, something shiny, anything, right? Anything can distract. Could be the worries. Could be the cares. Even if we're not careful, we can get distracted by our calling or the specific commands that God gave us from fulfilling our purpose. See, what does that mean? Because, you know, in Christendom, sometimes we think our purpose is what we're created to do, right? That's not your purpose. That's your calling. That's a specific command God gave for us to do. That's not your purpose. Let me show you your purpose. Mark chapter three, verse 13 and 14. Speaking of Jesus, and he went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted. And they came to him. Isn't it interesting? Jesus is gonna bring together the band of rugged men that we know of as the disciples who eventually became the apostles, the sent ones. And it says, he called to him those he himself wanted. Do you know that Jesus wants you? And he wants you with himself. He wants you to have a greater revelation of his person. He's calling you to be with him. That's your purpose. Verse 14. Then he appointed 12. Wow, so cool. They were called apostles, leaders of the church. They did miracles. They were martyrs. Yeah, that's what they did. That wasn't their purpose. What was their purpose? That they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Notice the priority, what happens first. He appointed the 12 first that they might be with him. Purpose. And that he might send them out to preach. Position. Preachers, teachers, apostles, prophets, evangelists. First, that they might be with him. Don't get distracted from your purpose. Your purpose every day when you wake up. First, is to be with him. Then it's to proclaim the good news. 
every night before you go to bed, first is to be with him. Then it's to lie down and rest in him. Every afternoon on the job, in the marketplace, with your family, with your friends, first is to be with him. Then it's to enjoy the fellowship of the community, to be a witness and a testimony. Don't get distracted from your purpose. Don't you dare ask who are you. You know who he is. But just follow what he tells you to do. I asked the team to come up and to sing this refrain that we sang during our time when we were worshiping the Lord. Maybe you've gotten distracted. Maybe you forgot. Or maybe God's just revealing himself to you once again. You just want to stay in that presence. As we sing, whatever's going on in your heart, would you just spend some time with God? You're welcome to sit, pray. You're welcome to stand and lift your hands and sing. You're welcome to just rest in who he is. But put your heart on the Lord. Listen for his voice. And let's follow him. Wherever you lead me, Wherever you go, I will follow. Wherever you lead me, wherever you go, I will follow. Wherever you lead me, wherever you go, I will follow wherever you lead me wherever you go I will follow wherever you lead me wherever you go I will follow Wherever you lead me, wherever you go, I will follow. Wherever you lead me, wherever you go, I will follow. things that you've spoken to us, God, we will be careful to follow every word. Lord, we thank you, God, that you reveal yourself to us over and over again. God, we choose to remember your power. God, your mighty works, which you've done in the past. And Father God, we thank you, Lord. We will stay in our purpose, God, to be with you.